Hello, and welcome to a classical video discussing the way that trans people exist within media or TV. In this video, I am, of course, going to be talking about another way in which an American cartoon either succeeded or failed to include trans representation within it, or more likely, the way that it sort of ended up being a mixed bag of good and bad. Unfortunately, these things normally end up being a little bit nuanced, which I know YouTube hates, but that's how it is. And yes, it is another cartoon American show about a normal family structure centred around their regular dad, but with messed up dynamics and parallels that make you question the nuclear family and the American dream that it represents. Yes, that's right, we're talking about The Simpsons. No, no, wait, we've already done that. We're talking about Family Guy. The, the, already done that one too. Um, American Dad? Haven't, haven't done that one yet, but, but also that's not it. Uh, Cleveland Show. King of the Hill? Rick and Morty? Venture Bros? How much longer can I keep up this bit before it stops being funny? Okay, I'm sorry. I was trying to make a dig at how a lot of American cartoon TV does end up doing this family-centric style, but it's Bob's Burgers. We're doing Bob's Burgers, okay? You, you can read the title. You probably clicked on this because it was clearly about Bob's Burgers. So, you know. It's a show about an odd family that tries to make its way in the world through all the difficulties that come about from kind of relatable situations taken to extreme and funny circumstances, with the whole idea of family bonds being at its core. What it does differently is that this one has a burger place as the main setting rather than a living room, so, you know, pretty innovative stuff. I was never much of a fan of Bob's Burgers. It wasn't that I didn't like it or didn't find it funny, but I think I'd just grown out of the phase where that kind of show appealed to me. But they have a trans episode. Ki kind of, not really, but kind of. And they definitely have trans characters. And you know, that means that I gotta come out of retirement and get back in there to figure out the question of did Bob's Burgers do good? Did it do trans stuff better than other shows in the same category as it? You know, the important stuff. Let's jump in. So the main focus of the video, the meat of this essay sandwich, is a singular episode within the very first season of the show. Episode 6 to be precise, and Sheesh Cab Bob to be even more precise. I, I think I'm pronouncing that episode title right. It, it's one of those titles where it has some weird grammar stuff going on in it, so it's like more tricky than just saying Sheesh Kabob. And already, I am a little bit impressed. Admittedly, Bob's Burgers started a lot later than the shows that I would compare it to, but there is still a lot to be said for the boldness of at least doing any trans stuff within the first season of a primetime Fox Broadcasting Company show created by and written by white dudes. There is an air of brave possibility in that, especially seeing as some, like The Simpsons, didn't bother at all for, well, 30 years to even get close to this. But the possibility of bravery only takes a show so far. And at some point, we have to come face to face with the facts of what the episode did and said all the way back in 2011. The main narrative of this particular episode is Tina's 13th birthday and her desire for it to be perfect as her stepping into womanhood, with a whole bunch of fancy and expensive stuff for it like a fog machine, and also one specific boy from a rival restaurant shop across the road that is important to the plot of the episode but, but not really important to us here in what we care about, i.e. the trans people. To facilitate this birthday, and to make it this perfect event, Bob goes to the landlord to ask for an extension on rent so that they can afford it, due to them being, like, pretty damn working class and near the poverty line. And the landlord instead offers the compromise of Bob doing some side work for him to pay for the birthday. 
What if I don't give you an extension on your rent, but I do give you the opportunity to earn some extra money in one of my side businesses? That sounds sketchy. Oh, it is, Bob. There is this horrifying underlying thing about the requirements on a lot of American parents to have to work multiple jobs to be able to afford to give their family the life that they need or want. The whole essence of that side hustle thing, which is madness, and we see the madness in the fact that Bob is basically left with almost no real personal time, sleeping as soon as he gets back from his new additional job of being a cab driver. Now, before we get into it, I just want to briefly say that as a not fan of this show, it, that's, that's pretty damn funny. Certainly funnier than, like, Family Guy, and, and yes, you might suspect right now as a fan of it that I am buttering you up because I absolutely am buttering you up, because I'm about to say some probably negative things. Which brings us to the topic we actually want to discuss here, and, and hopefully away from that whole rather dire discussion about the gig economy and the precarious standards of living for many Americans, which I'm not prepared to do, and towards the real discussion of the transness in the episode, which comes to us through Bob's cabbie job. One of the groups that he picks up on his first night of doing it are three women dressed in rather revealing attire, which he then realises are actually men midway through the drive. We get this realisation in response to the... trans people? But that's said with a question mark because of something I want to get into after we review the entire episode. But we get the realisation because they mention how many other cab drivers don't stop to pick them up and Bob finally takes a good look at them while asking why that would be the case, and he hones in on the Adam's apple, the facial hair stubble, and the arm hair on these question mark trans people. Huh. And uh, that's because you are... Fabulous! <laughs> that's true. <laughs> well, you're clearly fabulous, yeah. yes. Because, you know, th those are the indicators of not really being a woman, right? Those obvious facets that... Oh, 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 wait a minute. No, that's right. Those are also things that cis women deal with as well. I mean, the procedures to respond to them, tracheal shaves, laser hair removal, all of those market themselves to cis women more than trans women from businesses because those are things that all women get made to feel self-conscious about get made to feel as if having those makes them less of a woman. And this setup here is kind of playing into that narrative. It's a misogynistic joke, plain and simple. Bob doesn't say anything explicit about it, just kind of nervously laughs along with the confident way in which these trans people respond to him. And the ride continues, but that zooming in was still there. Now, our next comment or inclusion of trans stuff is when Bob gets back home and tells his family that he learned a bunch about transvestites last night. Now, yet again, shelve the comment of transvestite away in your head because if you're anything like me, it is cropping up right now. The confusing thought of, well, hang on a second, are these people transgender or are they transvestites? Because there is a difference between those two things. And like I said, I'll get to it after the recap. I'll get to discussing that very confused situation. Bob's son responds to him with a comment about how he has clearly gone onto a website that featured trans people in some way that was probably sexual or at least not comfortable to him as he's okay with getting banned from the computer for the next two days because of what he saw. Guess who learned a lot about transvestites last night? I was only on that website for like two seconds! What? No, I was talking about me. I picked up a group of transvestite hookers who showed me a side of this town I never knew existed. And Gene, you're banned from the computer for two days. After what I saw, I'm, I'm fine with that. It's like a joke about grossness at the idea of trans bodies, a, a classic jab towards us in this case, done through the hintings towards trans porn. You know, the idea of men being disgusted by trans people, or trans women specifically, is that's, that's a classic joke for pretty much every show. As the episode progresses on to us seeing more of Bob at his work, 
we come to realise that he is acting as effectively an escort service, transporting people to sex workers, and he takes men to the trans sex workers, men who clearly didn't specifically ask for that particular situation, but Bob encourages them to be okay with it. I honestly don't really, really know how to interpret this whole scene of events. Like, it definitely emphasises for me a point that is brought up during the first scene with the trans sex workers. I, I also want to make clear that I will not be calling them hookers or prozies or, or whatever. It, it's sex workers in this essay. Which is that idea that Bob is not necessarily transphobic. He doesn't not accept them or be cruel to them or not consider them to be whatever they want to be considered as, the framing of the jokes in the episode might direct us as an audience towards considering them as part of some comedy, but Bob himself does not do that. And the guy looking for sex workers, once encouraged about it, shrugs and goes along with it. But yet again, as this is a sitcom, it, its predominant purpose is to pack a joke into a scene, is to craft comedy. I'm left wondering, what is the comedy of this moment? Is it that the guy was clearly after a woman, and that Bob directed him to the trans woman instead, and that the guy was then okay with it, because if so, I'm not really sure I see what the joke is here, or, or who the joke is meant to be on. We're meant to laugh at the guy for... for Ooh, accidentally, he's now going to get with a trans woman, even though he, like, kind of was obviously like, yeah, sure, okay. Or are we laughing at Bob for for, for taking this guy who clearly wanted a woman because he did the that and taking him to a trans woman? Is, is, is Bob the joke here? Or is the joke the transness? I, I, I don't really know. Th this is a continuing theme that runs through the episode for me. And that makes it hard to be sure what to think about Bob's Burger's stance on trans women or transness as comedy. The next scene is a much smaller scene, with the trans sex workers in the back of the cab again, this time with them discussing the fact that Bob has to shave his moustache if he wishes for that one boy that Tina really likes to come to the party, because that boy's dickhead father demands that as payment for allowing his son to go. And you have something I want to add to my collection. Your mustache. Your bushy, robust, filthy eyesore of a moustache. There's a fight between the trans sex workers, as two of them make a dig at the other over the fact that she has a moustache still, which leads to a pretty aggressive response, because it's Clearly some kind of sore subject. Miss it. Honey, news flash. I can see it from here. You can see it from space? <laughs> Stop it, Cha Cha. I will thumb your eyeballs out of your skull. Now, obviously I don't need to tell you about the way that TV shows will often use the threat of physical violence as a method of showcasing male coding, and the use of that here in reference to these trans women is something that does at least raise a few flags about what is being said here around them, uh, about what is being posited, or at least what we as an audience are supposed to be thinking in this particular scene. Are, are we meant to be going, oh, this is clearly crossing a line into something that's ultimately a point of contention for a lot of trans people, and that this response, while emotional and over the top, is obviously the sign of a trigger happening that they are not liking, or are we meant to be thinking, oh, haha, ha, these men dressed as women are having a go at each other over the lack of femininity, and it's funny that it makes them this mad and this violent. I'm not so sure where Bob's Burgers is leading us in this regard. Maybe neither of those are true, but it's always a question of what are we meant to be thinking in this situation. But this all resolves as Bob soothes the conversation by making a kind and not explicitly targeted comment about being okay with whatever is on top of Glitter, the transsex worker in question's upper lip. He then gets invited to hang out with the sex workers after work, which involves them offering crack. Because, you know, sex workers and crack. Look, it's, it's, it's not subtle stereotypes here, alright? Yeah! We'll throw back a few beers and smoke some crack. Crack? Just the beer then. 
our final involvement of the trans people within the episode is at the end, when we discover that Bob, while drunk and high on crack, told the trans sex workers to come to his daughter's birthday party and to bring whoever they wanted along with them. Which leads to a bunch more trans sex workers, and also leads to the character that people would not stop commenting about when I talked about Bob's Burgers at all. Marshmallow makes their big entrance. Where do I put my cone? Oh, hey, Marshmallow. Now, Marshmallow doesn't have much of a role in this episode, which did leave me a little confused as to why they made such an impact. I mean, they've got like one cool line or two cool lines in everything, but, but the digging I did after the episode sort of answered that question for me, and, and I'll try my best to answer it for you after as well. Now, the role of the trans sex workers within this final scene is threefold, which is like twofold, but one more. Firstly, they are part of a joke about Bob bringing his inappropriate work life into his home life. A joke that's more at Bob's expense than at theirs, as they don't get kicked out and, and nobody really makes a fuss about it. Heck, Louise, the youngest of Bob's children, but the one who is the toughest and darkest character of the whole group, the one who is manipulative and aggressive and exploitative, which is it's sort of like Stewie from Family Guy, but everyone can understand her and are terrified of her. Well, well, well Louise asks Marshmallow where her name came from, and the response is a pretty golden one. So, Marshmallow, how'd you get your name? Because if you show me a sweet potato pie, I am on top of it. I knew it! Nobody has a major problem with the sex workers being here. And aside from Linda making a comment about it, it's not shown as really ruining the party. Because the big problem for Tina is that she wanted that damn boy to be here. That's the thing really ruining the party, because she wanted to get in her womanly kisses. Which leads us to our second role of the trans sex workers, which has been the voice of the lesson of the episode. Telling Tina how nobody gets to decide or define her coming of womanhood. That she needs to seize it rather than letting the circumstances get her down. And that her father is doing the best he can to try and make things good. That he went through a lot of stuff with his job to try to make it the best party for her possible. Ultimately, there are voice of reason here as well. The people who tell us the facts that we should be listening to. And while there are sprinklings of trans jokes in the speech, the essence of it is a good one. The trans jokes themselves are at heart nothing too radical or too transphobic. Life gives you lemons, you need to tuck them. Don't let anyone stop you from grabbing womanhood. Not even a town full of doctors who refuse to cut off your penis. You know, it's, it's nothing that's going to break the bank on trans comedy, but it's also nothing that is too off-putting. The final role of the trans sex workers is informing Bob about the weird kink habits of his rival restaurant dad so that he can use it to get his revenge and clean up the episode. And that's it. Pesto is one of your dates? He wishes. We run in the same circles. He's a regular over at the Desire Dungeon. He's what's known as a diaper lover. You know what that is? It's nasty. So I have built a fair bit of backlog into this one. And I'd like to go over those now before we get into the quality of this episode in regards to trans representation. The big thing is the initial confusion of whether this is trans representation at all. I know to a lot of cis writers and cis people, the difference between a transvestite and a transgender person might seem non-existent, but in reality it does matter quite significantly especially because the confusion carries over into the writing of the show and will then affect the audience who will then continue to be confused and it just it's like a loop of confusion with people not knowing what the words mean. A transvestite is someone who predominantly wears clothing associated with the other gender. A transgender person is someone who identifies with a gender different to the one they were assigned by some doctor at birth or one that they've had foisted upon them by society over a time period. In Bob's Burgers, we can see this confusion really manifest and make it tricky to openly consider the transness at play here. The trans sex workers refer to themselves and to one another in ways that blur that line. 
Hey, don't worry, ladies. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm a, I'm a married man. So am I. <laughs> they call themselves men and use the gender terminology that would be correct for those who merely dress in feminine outfits without necessarily transitioning into being a woman, like your drag queens or drag kings, which is another commonly applied terminology for something similar to transvestites, but not necessarily the same. There's more of a performance aspect in drag queens or kings. But it's become the more modern association as the old one of transvestite has fallen out of usage recently. But at the same time, they also discuss things that would make them more transgender, specifically seeking out permanent surgeries to conform their body more towards how they identify or see themselves as, possibly. The writers and the creators down the line confirmed that the intention here, especially with Marshmallow, who makes a lot more side appearances throughout the show, is for them to be trans women. So, working with that knowledge, you can see that the representation of trans women here is a mess. It does not align with the version or vision of trans women that acknowledges them knowing who they are, and that gets the cis characters on board with that information. Instead, circumventing all of that topic to have the trans characters keep being supplementary to the main plot and the comedy, acting more as devices to the narrative than guiding forces slash, you know, people. I understand that this is what happens when you don't have a trans episode, merely an episode that incidentally includes a bunch of trans people. From a series of writers who clearly did not do much research or interaction or inclusion of trans voices in the process. In this way, Bob's Burgers really does fall into the same trap that a lot of other cartoon shows have done with their trans representation. It's been a flawed version that is more damaging towards the subconscious bigotries that people might hold about trans women. While Bob's Burgers does in this episode effectively not have characters insult or attack or target the trans women with open comments or jibes like Simpsons, Family Guy, South Park and others, it does reassure the cis audience that yes, these trans women are really men, and that you should be nice to them, but never forget what they truly are. It's a kinder inclusion, but at the end of the day, it is still saying the same thing. And that extends beyond just how we see them in the episode. It also extends towards the voice actors for them, who are all in this original episode cis men. Stephen Aggie, Jack McBriar, Oscar Nunes, and David Herman. All of these people are reinforcing the same point, but just behind the camera. These are men, voiced by men, and it's much easier for shows to get away with that when it's for voice actors, because you don't have to visually see or get confirmation on the fact, but it's still flawed for the same reasons. It's flawed because it's cis men replacing the many talented trans voice actors who would be perfect for those roles and would help avoid the issue, but are often overshadowed because of the favoritism that goes along with established celebrities in the scene an establishment that often ends up being a bit of a boys club, and pushes out people from minorities hoping to make it in the industry. It signals the underlying representation issues with the characters as we mentioned, this cis inability to get the difference between a transvestite and a trans woman, and the indifference towards caring about learning. The inclusion of trans people in the process at the voice acting level also allows them to have more of a say on the character, to voice concerns about lines or dialogue or acting that isn't really representative of the trans community, and does perhaps reflect stereotypes that have come about because the ones in charge and the ones making the decisions so far have been cis straight men who have no real connection to the community in the first place. It's just a reinforcing loop of stereotypes. And on the note of stereotypes, I have one last thing about this episode I want to say before I move on to Bob's Burgers transness beyond the episode, and that is the way that trans people exist within it as sex workers. Bob, you invited transvestite prostitutes to our daughter's birthday party? No. 
Maybe. Uh, this week has been kind of a blur. If that isn't ringing any alarm bells for you, then you must be a lot younger than I am, or just don't watch much pop culture media. Because a consistent and long-term way that trans people are allowed to appear in shows is through being either sex workers, victims, or perverted serial killers, villains. This conforming of our representation for a long time was due to the fears and perception of the trans community from that majority cis audience. And the sex worker thing explicitly comes about thanks to the fact that for many trans people it is a source of income that is the only one that they can access, due to being forced out of regular employment and opportunities from a bigoted system and employers who view them as less desirable because of who they are. Discrimination pushes a lot of people into sex work, a field of work that's legality and safety often varies quite heavily from country to country, but generally has demographics seeking specific fetishes or kinks that make it a last resort option for those struggling. I don't want to get too much here into the nuances and political nature of sex work, I merely just want to say that within this household, we support our sex workers, and we support their right to have access to a working environment that gives them the ability to exist without fear and without worry of exploitation and danger. Oh, they should also be allowed to unionise. Banning the whole field fixes nothing except pushing it underground and does not deal with the underlying issues that cause people to turn to sex work when they don't want to, merely punishing those who do want to do sex work. But Bob's Burgers leans into this stereotyping of trans women and of sex workers to use it for the comedy of the episode and the narrative, and that's not really a big win in its corner. It's not a great thing. So, this might all feel quite negative right now, like I'm going to come out giving Bob's Burgers an F grade for failed on the trans rep. Which isn't true, mostly because we don't do grades on the channel. We've never done grades. Where'd you get that idea from? While this specific episode, early in the show's run and during 2011, is not a great inclusion of trans people, the series does go beyond that. It didn't stop at season one, and digging into how Bob's Burgers developed with trans characters specifically over time, what you see is the thing that we're always looking for, that any critic truly wants. Improvement. I'm not analysing shows and picking apart characters because I want the creators to stop, or because I want them to never make a trans person again. It's because I want them to do better. I'd like to provide the examples and tools for that. And Bob's Burgers is a good showcase for this in action, because specifically through the recurring character of Marshmallow, we do see things get better. She keeps coming back in future episodes, never playing a major part, but always existing as a side character or background element, and she's never mocked or attacked or put down for being who she is, an openly confident and proud trans woman. She's allowed to exist like any other character in Bob's Burgers does, and while we do get hung up on trans representation being trans issues front and centre on this channel, because right now what we really do need is, is for cis people to understand those issues and get better at seeing those problems affecting the community, We also need to recognise that characters who normalise the existence of trans people, who are blatantly trans but doesn't affect the way that they are written into narratives, is also a good thing that we want too. And that's what Marshmallow does. The writers and creators also improved upon one of those major flaws that I mentioned before by recasting the voice actor for Marshmallow changing it from David Herman, a cis white man, to Jari Jones, a black trans woman. Oh yeah, I I didn't mention that before because I wanted to whammy you with it here, but they really messed up the voice actor on this one. Like, intersectionally fucked it up in full display, as we see race and queerness overlap in the way that the voice acting industry will often refuse to hire minority people to play minority characters. It's the modern-day animated minstrel show, 
quite literally in this case. But they changed. They learned from those mistakes and from people criticising it and fixed the issue. It would have, obviously, been far better if the issue had never been there in the first place, but this is the second best thing. And it now functions to give cis audiences that better connection to a black trans woman, as a black trans woman is involved in the creative process around that character. And it also lets black trans women see themselves reflected in the media, being played by a black trans woman, not a cis white man pretending. Other shows can and should learn to do the same thing. When I describe Bob's Burgers as a mess in regards to its transness, I think people assume that to be always bad. Messes are rarely good in their entirety. But when you view it as the sum of parts that make up that mess, you can see that it's a mixture of good, bad, and confusing, which is more of what I'm seeing here. There are bad elements that needed work, aspects that reflect the continually underwhelming and disappointing way in which American cartoons fail to properly present trans characters or let trans people be involved in the process or let trans people voice them. But there are good elements too around that, things that are done differently to other shows, a generally more accepting vibe from most of the characters, and a refusal of the show to make the trans people or the transness the major villain or the major problem or the major mockery of the episode. And with time, the mess got a little cleaner. The bad stuff got corrected, and the good stuff got replicated. Ultimately, there's not much more I could hope for or expect from a show like this from the time it was, and that might be a bit of a bummer in itself, but things were pretty rough for trans characters back in the long, long time ago of like 10-20 years. For examples of that, watch any other video on this channel, which honestly you should be doing anyways, there's some pretty good bangers in there. Bob's Burgers is definitely a lot better than most of those. A lot less slur words too, which is always a positive in my book, but its most appealing aspect is that it improved. The Simpsons didn't. Family Guy is... actually that one's actually kind of complicated, and I do want to do a video on whether it did improve or not at some point. South Park definitely didn't. But Bob's Burgers learned from the criticism. It changed things. It fixed up its initial mistakes. So there is your takeaway for this. The thing that I think should be remembered about the trans representation of this series. That when we criticise as a community, it's not because we don't want cis people to do it, it's because we want it to be done well. And the, the best way to respond to that criticism is to change things. You as the creators have that power. You can write things better. You can go out and communicate and consult with trans people to improve that representation. That's the lesson, okay? That's that's the moral of the episode. If you like what I've done here and enjoyed the video or the topic, then shh, keep it to yourself. If you really like what I've done here and want to financially support the channel, then put whatever spare cash is lying around the house into a bottle and throw it down the nearest hole. If you don't carry cash or are unable to find holes, I suppose you could also try my Patreon. It's a great resource for giving me a reliable income for the channel that isn't dependent upon my willingness to fight broadcasting companies and YouTube for the right to get, like, some small scraps of money for the work I'm doing for them. The names of those in the $5 and up category should be scrolling past the screen right now, and every single person who does subscribe to my Patreon is really helping me to feel inspired and to keep wanting to make videos for the channel, and continue doing what I do here. Oh, I also made the promise that if I hit $1,000 a month on the Patreon, which is basically the point where it pays for my rent and other bills, I'll make a Q&A video featuring questions from you, the audience. Questions that I will answer. Any questions. Well, no, no, not any questions. Not that question, you weirdo. Why the hell would you even think that one? That's, that's pretty gross. That's nicer questions than that one, okay? 
Anyways, thank you for watching the video, and I hope you have a great day.